welcome back to the course on animal physiology. We are into the section 2 and today we will be getting into the third and the final lecture of the section 2. Section 2 which consists of our membrane physiology of nerve and muscle. Okay. So, we have already finished first two lectures and now we will be heading for the final lecture on this physiology of nerve and muscle. This is section 2, section 2 and lecture 3 of 3. There are 3 lectures which we dedicated for this section. So, we are done with first 2. Now, today we are moving into the next lecture. So, we started with this broad heading of membrane structure and dynamics. So, we have talked widely about the structural part of the membrane, but we have not talked about the dynamics of it. Dynamics means the membrane is a very dynamic structure. There is continuous exchange of information from inside to outside the cell and this information transfer is rapidly carried out by the membrane. So, this whole dynamicity is governed by a wide range of transport phenomena that is what we will be discussing. Before I move on to the dynamics of it, there are a couple of step which I hurriedly crossed in the last lecture in the almost at the fag end or the tail end of the last lecture, which has just want to reiterate it is kind of a carry over from the previous lecture and then I will move on to the dynamics part of it. So, in the last lecture I was talking about the presence of the carbohydrates on top of the membrane. Okay. So, I told you there are two ways by which carbohydrate can bind the carbohydrate like this, if this is the membrane, if this is the membrane which has been shown by two lines and I am just putting the hatchet hatched uh, this thing. So, one option is that the carbohydrate is directly attached the way it has been shown here on the lipid or there may be a protein like this. So, which is represented by like this protein and on top of the protein there is a carbohydrate which is attached. Okay. So, there are two motives by which a carbohydrate can attach on top of a membrane. Here is the carbohydrate, carbohydrate okay. and here is the lipid and this is inside the cell and this one is outside the cell. Okay. So, I highlighted one point, but as in a in a rush we just finished it that carbohydrates are present always on the outer surface. So, they face outside the cell. What really carbohydrate does actually? One of the thing which carbohydrate does is it helps in cell to cell signaling and it helps in the identification of the different cell types. They are kind of you know your house has a house number, then you have a name of the colony, then you have the name of the city and on top of that there is a zip code or a pin code. Okay. So, that is how your letter reaches to a specific to your house. Same way a cell has such identification mark and those identification marks are in the form of carbohydrates which are present on the cell surface. So, these carbohydrate determines. So, all of you are aware of that we are having different kind of blood groups. So, we have like you know as you are aware of you people have blood groups like A, B, A, B and O. This blood group is determined by those carbohydrates which are present on the surface. Okay. These are determined by the carbohydrates on cell surface this is one of the major role and we will be discussing in depth what are the structure of these. Apart from it there are certain, so how we study this carbohydrate. So, under the broad heading how we study these carbohydrates which are present on the 
cell surface. So, one of the potent tool is a range of molecules called lectins. These are carbohydrate binding proteins, carbohydrate binding proteins and some of these major proteins are concanavalin A and there are some thing called wheat glutenin and all these kind of molecules which bind to these different carbohydrates and these are being used. So, these are the tools by which we study the carbohydrate molecules which are present on the cell surface and they have a profound role to play in different kind of physiological uh, processes which are taking place. And not only cell identification they help in chemotaxis and the migration of the cell and several other phenomena which are exceptionally important for proper physiological functioning of the body. Apart from it another topic where I kind of ended up how we isolate the membrane proteins from the membrane using detergent. We I talked about some of the detergents like you know how okay, let me put the question how we use how we use detergents in studying the membrane proteins. So, some of the detergent examples of some of the detergents which I talked about in the last class was Triton and a few others. So, what they exactly do is that say for example, if this is the membrane okay, and you have these membrane proteins sitting here like this. Okay. So, so, if this is the membrane, so let me give another shade. So, this is the green what you are seeing is the lipid bilayer sorry the blue what you are saying is the lipid bilayer and this green are the membrane proteins which are spanning across the membrane. So, what we do is say for example, this red we add a detergent okay. say for example, triton what the detergent does is something very interesting. Next come out depending on the concentration of the detergent to get out of is that you get this membrane protein let me shade it in green the way it is and on top of that you have a small layering of the lipids around it likewise. And once you have this particular membrane protein out of the surface though it is a exceptionally challenging process by the way here is the membrane protein at your for your further experiment if we reconstitute membrane protein. So, this is a membrane protein this is a membrane protein and this is the membrane and this is where you are adding the triton into it okay. and then we reconstitute the protein in lipid vesicles. This is the part which uh, I wish to highlight in this. It, this is a carryover from the previous lecture, where uh, we just hurriedly close on because of time constraint in the last lecture. So, this was what was missing. So, this is the tail piece which I needed to add before I start with the membrane structure and dynamics. So, coming back to it. So, where we are supposed to use this start this lecture. So, membrane structure. So, we are done with the structural part. So, this part is done. Now, we are starting the dynamics part and I told you broadly dynamics is the all kind of movements which are taking place across the membrane. So, there are different transport phenomena which dictates uh, the dynamics part of it or the dynamicity of the membrane, because you have to realize that there are several molecules which has to be exchanged across the membrane. The water has to be exchanged, the salts have to be exchanged, at times there are nutrient like glucose which is the major energy currency has to be exchanged, because we have to have the glucose intake then there is movement of several other small molecules across the membrane and this process has to be regulated with exceptional precision and clarity. 
otherwise we would not survive. Not only that cell needs to secrete out a wide range of molecules outside it, it some of these uh, excuse me, some of these includes neurotransmitters which have to be secreted by the nerve cells to communicate with other nerve cells. There are endocrine cells which secretes hormones which uh, takes care of a wide range of physiological functions which we deal with. Apart from it the cell has to regulate its water, sometime it has to take in water, sometime it has to get rid of water, sometime it has to throw away the toxic material from inside the cell, so that it can survive. Apart from it there are several other energy transduction processes, which requires a lot of membrane dynamics processes, which includes conduction which includes uh, energy synthesis, especially in the case of mitochondrial membrane, in the case of photosynthetic membrane. So, what we will do in this section or in this lecture, first of all we will broadly classify the different transport phenomena of molecules, which regulates a lot of physiological processes in the body. So, broadly speaking, if I had to classify the different phenomena of transport phenomena, the transport phenomena could be classified into two broad groups. One is energy dependent processes, the other one is energy independent processes or in other words one is without need for any energy, the other one is you need energy for the transport to take place. So, based on that there are two terms, one is called the passive transport, where you do not need any kind of energy. There are physical constraint, which leads to the movement of x, y, z molecules and there is active transport. Okay. So, broadly let me classify it in terms of the membrane transport. If I had to put it like this, membrane transport, it could fall under passive transport and active transport these are the two broad and on a very, very broad heading you can classify them. And based on that, if I had to diagrammatically show you and if I consider this as a cell. So, for example, this box the structure is a cell with uh, uh, bilipid layer. So, one of the process of passive transport is diffusion, then you have something called will come in depth with that facilitated diffusion then you have something called filtration then you have conduction Then I am now putting something on red, which is called active transport. This is I am putting it red purposefully, because this is uh, energy I am just putting it energy dependent phenomena. Whereas, the one I am now putting them as green are energy independent phenomena. And within this broad heading you have some phenomena called exocytosis, endocytosis and we will come in depth into cytosis. Okay. So, these are the broad broad ways of you know classifying the different uh, transport phenomena, which takes place across the different membrane. Okay. So, now we will do again we will redraw that. Uh, transport phenomena, transport across membrane. Under the broad heading and first we will be dealing with a process called exocytosis, these are some of the key and endocytosis. what is exocytosis and what is endocytosis. Exocytosis exo as the name indicates 
to look at it x o. x o means you are throwing out something outside the cell. Say for example, a cell has, so this is a cell and it has excess water. Okay. It has a lot of, so this is a cell and it has lot of water, lot of water molecules. So, it has to throw away this water molecule. So, throwing out of these water molecules of throwing out of uh, materials outside the cell outside the cell falls under exocytosis. This is one of the key phenomena which dictates the regulation of several fluids across the membrane. Next is endocytosis, which is just the reverse of it. Endocytosis. Endocytosis is of two kinds. So, first of all, what is endocytosis? So, if this is the cell, this is your cell, and you are taking something inside the cell, taking a molecule. inside the cell. That is what endocytosis means. Endocytosis could be of two kinds. Endocytosis, it could be called pinocytosis or phagocytosis. Pinocytosis or phagocytosis. What is pinocytosis and what is phagocytosis? Pinocytosis is a process by which a lot of fluid material is taken inside the cell. Fluid entry and whereas, in phagocytosis solid particle entry. This is the basic difference between pinocytosis and phagocytosis. Okay. This is the broad, under the broad heading of pinocytosis and phagocytosis and they have a profound role to play. Whereas, in exocytosis, exocytosis is one of the uh, regulatory mechanism by which a cell gives away neurotransmitter, the nervous signal, the way the cell send the neurotransmitter, it is by an exocytosis process, whereas in endocytosis it takes stuff inside it. So, I expect that people should be very clear about these two words, exo and endocytosis. Throwing outside the cell, taking inside the cell. This is exceptionally important. Okay. After this, we move on to the next, which is called a diffusion process. Simple diffusion. Oh, sorry. So, to so, this diffusion process is governed by the concentration variant. So, there are two or three uh, factors which dictate diffusion. Say for example, let us think of a situation out here. Okay. There are two chambers out here. Say this is say for example, chamber A, this is chamber B. Okay. So, within chamber A, you have a white number of these greens are the molecules which are present in chamber A and along with you know you have a lot of water molecules out there or some kind of a solvent out there. So, what is happening in this? In this side the concentration of this green molecule, if I have to say the concentration of the green molecule is very high. So, invariably what will happen? This green molecule will try to 
diffuse to the other side into chamber B, they will move like this. So, these green molecules will try to you know diffuse and equilibrate on both sides. So, there will be intermediate situation and eventually you will see this B side will have equal number of green moving from one side from side A to side B and vice versa. This is the basic basic understanding of diffusion, which is ex extremely important for you people to understand that this is one of the processes the transport phenomena, which is the simplest of all. So, what are the factors which affect? So, for example, let us uh, put it like this the effect of pore size on membrane permeability. In other words, what we are going to deal in this situation is, what are the factors which dictates your diffusion. Diffusion is being governed by permeability, how much the membrane is permeable, permeability of the membrane, pore size, this is extremely important, what is the size of the pore. Third is the membrane area or what is the area covered by the membrane. The fourth one is thickness of the membrane. So, if your area is more, say for example, you have more area than I am just putting it a up, upward arrow. So, the, the possibility that the diffusion will be more provided the pore size supports it. Okay. So, for example, you have more cross section to travel or in other words the membrane is very thick. Say for example, something like this. So, there will be a slower diffusion. So, based on this several kind of equations could be derived that how the membrane is, what are the pore sizes and what are the selective things and based on that certain things can pass, certain things may not be able to pass. So, it is it's kind of a very, very dynamic process and this helps us to <coughs> look at cells, look at natural things where they are they become selectively permeable, because it allows say for example, a membrane may allow carbon dioxide to pass, may not allow a bigger molecule to pass through or it may allow water to pass, it may not allow some other gas to pass through it likewise. So, there are several variations across nature and this is exceptionally important for us to understand this whole diffusion is governed by these simple factors permeability pore size, cross sectional, a cross sectional area, overall area, the surface area and all these different parameters. And based on that one can develop any form of equations by which you can really understand the whole process of uh, the whole membrane dynamics, how the molecules are criss crossing across the membrane. Okay. From here we move on to the next phase that is called filtration. Filtration is a much more simple process. So, for example, filtration is divided is, is sorry, filtration is, is a, a function of the hydrostatic pressure. So, you can filter something from one side to another side, provided there is a pressure difference and that will flow through. So, it is a direct function, filtration is a is a, is a directly governed by hydrostatic pressure. In other words, this hydrostatic pressure is the governing force in taking care of the filtration. So, if I say this difference in hydrostatic pressure is shown by delta P, that this decides what will filter through. Apart from this, there is another factor that what are the pore size, which dictate what will filter through. So, for example, if your filter size is say 2 micron and you have a molecule which is 4 micron. 
So, whatsoever pressure you give most unlikelihood of 4 micron molecule will pass through 2 micron, unless otherwise the molecule can shrink through and get through by some way some means or other. Okay. Or say for example, you have a pore size of 0.2 micron and you have a molecule which is like 10 micron. There is no way that 10 micron molecule which is so huge can pass through a 0.2 micron filter. So, the pore size is exceptionally important, the pressure you are putting across the two side is exceptionally important. So, one of the key role is played by the hydrostatic pressure and the pore size and of course, again all the parameters will come into play the surface, the amount of surface which is exposed with the filter and the cross section of the filter and all these things. And it is a very hot area of research where several uh, innovative filters are getting inspiration from biological component. They see natural phenomena, natural filtration assemblies and they get uh, inspiration to develop next generation of filters. So, third thing we are going to deal with is called osmosis, which is a very specialized form of diffusion. If I had to, it is a, it's a it's basically called a special case of diffusion, special case of be very careful on this one, because many people kind of get confused with what osmosis is all about. Uh, try to put it, uh, it refers to the diffusion of water or any other solvent, uh, to move to the next page, any other solvent down its concentration gradient. This is exceptionally important. Concentration gradient of water of water, oh one second of water arises whenever, whenever there is unequal concentration, there is unequal concentration of particles across a membrane, across a membrane. This is ex extremely important, that is permeable and this is another important aspect of osmosis, that is permeable to water, but please highlight this, but not to the particles. In other word, I am highlighting this word, not to the particles. In other word, we are talking about a semi permeable or or selectively permeable membrane. So, if I had to draw this, it is something like say for example, uh, I think this is not the right way to draw it. Say for example, here is a membrane this is the membrane. This membrane will allow water to flow on both sides likewise, but if say for example, you have these uh, particles, okay, different kind of particles or say for example, you have these uh, red and green balls, what you could see out here. It would not allow the red or the green balls or any other kind of particles which are present. These are different particles, if we if it would not allow any of those to pass through it. So, their mobility of these, these red, green or this magenta color balls and everything will be concentrated. They would not be allowed to pass through it and this is the situation when you will see uh, osmosis phenomena taking place. And if I had to put it in terms of word, then you will say the, the non diffusible, the what I showed you, the non diffusible particles, 
this is extremely important, please get your basics very right on this. Non diffusible particles, which I was drawing like you know the red and then the green and, uh, and the magenta and all those, non diffusible particles exert exert an osmotic pull, osmotic pull on water. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, I just have to one second, I am just missing on the track. On. Just kindly pardon me, because I just missed the slide. Uh, okay. Yeah, osmotic pull on water that can be one second, one second, yeah, that can be quantified in terms of osmotic pressure. This is extremely important for you people to understand, which is sometimes denoted with pi the sign, okay. that uh, this osmosis phenomena, it is an specialized diffusion process, which is dictated by the gradient of water, but this diffusion phenomena takes place through a selectively permeable membrane. This selectively permeable membrane does not allow the solutes to pass through, it only allows certain solvents to pass through them. And this phenomena is so very important, that this is the same phenomena by which some of the most important example, we all urinate we do not lose a lot of water from the kidney. This does not happen, because kidney, the role of osmosis you could see in kidney in urine formation. We retain a lot of water, okay. we have a very concentrated urine, this is called water retention. This water retention in the kidney is an example, classic example of osmosis phenomena. Okay. Then, uh, we know these blood capillaries, which are carrying blood all over our body. Okay. They do not lose a lot of fluid, fluid loss is controlled, fluid loss is controlled in the capillaries by by the osmosis process and this is governed by this is governed by several proteins which are present and i am showing in the dot these are the several proteins which are present and same way in the kidney there are whole bunch of proteins which are present which pulls back the water and does not allow the water to be lost so this is the importance of this whole process of osmosis which is a specialized diffusion and please be careful it is the force exerted by the non diffusible particle and on water and that is called the osmotic pressure. It is exceptionally important for you people to understand and clarify this thing. Okay. From here we move on to, let us classify all the different. So, another, okay, before we classify it, let us talk about another form of uh, transport phenomena that is called conduction. Anyway, this conduction phenomena we are going to come in bigger detail very soon while we will be talking about the nervous system conduction. Conduction phenomena is like this, the flow of these uh, sodium, potassium and using different kind of pumps, where the sodium is being thrown away and potassium gets in. So, these are the channels, let me put them in red, the channels Okay, let me put some kind of channels. So, these are the channels, these are the pumps, these are the pumps. So, this kind of process, where electrical ionic conduction taking place, 
the ions are moving and that those ions lead to the generation of electrical impulses, which is uh, our lifeline like in the heart, which will be our next topic actually, where the heart impulses are regulating the heart beating. Okay. Then the nerve impulses, which helps us to communicate with uh, or send any form of information from outside our body to the brain and even from inside our body to the brain and ask the brain to respond back. These are all taken care by the specialized membranes of the nerves and the muscles and under the muscles of course, you have the smooth muscles from the gastrointestinal tract, you have the cardiac muscle from the heart and you have the skeletal muscle from all over your body. So, these are specialized uh, membranes and we will be talking about these membranes as we will be talking about the nervous uh, nerves and their function and everything. Okay. We will be talking about in depth about it. So, at this stage I am not getting uh, far into that. Okay. The next one there is another term we talked about uh, osmosis we talked about diffusion and then under diffusion we talked about osmosis, then we will talk about another word which will come across called facilitated diffusion. What does this mean? The word itself is self explanatory, something which facilitate a process, something which it promotes the process. It is something like this, let me draw it that will make it say for example, this is the membrane there and there is a transport protein sitting like this. Okay. Say for example, okay. and, and this is your membrane what I have drawn. Let me just put a color the membrane in green, this is, okay. this is the membrane and in red you see a transport protein. transport protein. Okay. Now, <laughs> what happens say for example, uh, something has to be transported across it by a process of diffusion. So, what happens is this and this is the protein out here. Okay. The molecule say for example, is denoted by say black okay, these molecules. So, these molecules go and bind here likewise. Okay. This. So, once they bind here, and they adhere on this surface. And then this particular protein changes its conformation and what you see next is this. And so, this is outside and this is inside and this is again outside, this is inside. Now, you have transported those molecules inside, which is taken bare or facilitated by falling under facilitated diffusion. Okay. They fall under a bigger heading of facilitated diffusion. So, if I had to uh, kind of you know classify the mechanism and the driving force, which I am going to do for the passive transport. So, this is what I will do before I move on to active transport. Passive transport Okay. And I am classifying passive transport as uh, mechanism and the driving force, driving force. So, you have diffusion, you have filtration, you have osmosis, you have you have conduction. These are the major ones and the conduction is taken care by the voltage gradient. Osmosis is taken care by the concentration gradient of water. Filtration is by hydrostatic. So, this is the summary hydrostatic pressure and diffusion is by concentration gradient of both solute and solvent. Okay. So, these are some of the uh, overall outline and talking about the facilitated diffusion, let me just go back. So, this facilitated diffusion is extensively used for in glucose transport, we will come, we will we'll come back to all these things as we will be going through the course. 
glucose transport in our body in the intestine and other places is being taken care by facilitated diffusion process. Okay. So, now from here we will move on to the active transport processes. Active. So, now we are moving from as of now we talked about all the processes which are non energy dependent, they did not need energy. energy. Okay. Active transport, active transport needs active participation of energy rich molecules like ATPs. So, these are the energy dependent transport, sorry, energy dependent transport phenomena. In energy dependent transport phenomena, you have two kind of active transport, one is called primary active transport and you have secondary active transport. So, what is primary and what is secondary? So, now we will next slide we will talk about the primary active transport. So, primary active transport are taken care by ion pumps. Let me give you an example in we will talk about the ion pumps you remember I was telling you in, in, in the last class. So, if this is the cell and this is the inside and this is outside. So, there are bunch of pumps which takes care of uh, likewise which are sitting there which changes their conformation and ensures that uh, the flow of potassium and throwing away of sodium from the cell and thereby maintaining the homeostasis of the cell. These ion pumps are primary active transporters, they help in and they are completely tell you ATP dependent. If you remember in the last class I told you they are ATP dependent and ATP has to be present inside the, inside the cell ATP dependent. And I talk about one of the molecules called oven which blocks these uh, ion pumps. So, these are these ion pumps are extremely crucial from the Nobel laureate Jan Skau who actually uh, discovered the structure of them, got a Nobel prize for it, um, realized that these ion pumps are the ones which uh, decides uh, the potential difference across a cell, across especially across as a matter of fact any cell. So, they ensure inside the cell we have lesser amount of sodium we have lesser amount of glucose, we have higher amount of potassium, we have higher amount of few other molecules as compared to outside where the glucose is higher, your uh, sodium is higher, amino acids is lower whereas, amino acid inside the cell is higher. So, these all these different kind of phenomena are uh, all these different kind of variations especially with the sodium and potassium is being governed by uh, the primary active transport, which uses these kind of uh, pumps. Okay. So, now from here we will talk about the secondary active transport. Secondary active transport, secondary active transport are of two types, one is called co-transport, the other one is called counter transport counter transport. Okay. So, and as we will move into the course, we will come across several uh, situation of co transport and counter transport. Okay. So, <coughs> at this stage uh, what I will do is, we will just give you a brief idea about co transport and counter transport. So, one of the simple example is that the movement of 
sodium ions along the concentration and voltage gradient that is established by sodium potassium pump can be used to pull another substance. along with it. In a process called sodium, sorry, uh, sorry I just uh, missed the slide, It'll bear with me. In a process called sodium co-transport. So, along with this another substance is being carried, okay. this falls under sodium co-transport. So, we will come in depth about many of these. So, some of the examples where this co-transport and counter-transport phenomena are being used, I needed to highlight is in especially in the kidney. In the kidney, glucose absorption, so that we do not do the absorption then in the intestine glucose absorption these are all uh, secondary active transport these all are secondary active transport phenomena okay the rate limitations of uh, these transport phenomena limitation of transport uh, mechanisms is with the is depending on the carrier proteins and the overall composition if you look at it inside and outside the cell so you will see sodium will be lower inside the cell potassium will be higher amino acids will be higher outside sodium will be lower potassium will be uh, sorry i'm sorry sodium will be higher, potassium will be lower, glucose will be higher outside the cell, glucose will be far more higher outside the cell and uh, among the total body fluid there are these body fluids are being distributed in, in two compartments either it could be intracellular or extracellular. So, major concentration of water is in the intracellular fluid and lower concentration is outside into the extracellular fluid. So, this brings us to an conclusion about our second section of the topic which is membrane physiology of nerve and muscle. Uh, what I expect is that you should have a very clear idea about the structure of the membrane, the different components of the membrane which includes the lipids, which is the major component including the glycolipids and the phospholipids. Apart from it you should understand the lipids are classified as storage lipids and membrane lipids and we are talking about the membrane lipids. You should have a fair understanding about the role of cholesterol then you should understand the role of the proteins, membrane proteins, how they are embedded and how within the uh, lipid bilayer with the non covalent interactions and the examples I cited about valinomycin and gramicidine which are probed to understand how the probably these proteins have evolved and several toxins which has the channel forming ability. I gave you an example of an anti carrier antibi antibiotic. Apart from it, expect you to have an understanding about the uh, uh, carbohydrate molecules which are decorating the outer surface of the cell membrane, which helps the cells to identify 
uh, they gave an identification mark to the cell, they helped in whole bunch of chemotaxis and a whole other techniques. And you should have a fair understanding about uh, different techniques which are being used, which I talked about lipid vesicle, lipid bilayer studies and uh, freeze fracture technique, fluorescence uh, technique to understand the mobility of the lipids and the proteins across the membrane. And from there uh, you should have a uh, overview about the different dynamic processes or the transport phenomena which includes the passive transport and active transport across the membrane, which include diffusion, osmosis, conduction, facilitated diffusion, exocytosis, endocytosis and in the active transport you have primary active transport and secondary active transport. Within the secondary active transport you should have uh, there is co-transport, there is counter transport. So, overall with this basic understanding I assume we will enter into our next topics, which will be much in depth, but the whole basis lies here. Okay. So, with this I will close in the lecture and we will start with the next topic next day. Thanks.